The person whom we know as the Buddha, meaning awakened or enlightened one, was originally named Siddhartha Gautama, and he was a prince in the kingdom of capital of Astu. He was married and even had a son. But by the age of 29, he had grown restless. He was unhappy. He was suffering. He knew that there was more to this world and to this life than all the pleasures that he was experiencing within the kingdom's walls. So one night, he just snuck out of the palace. He cut off all of his hair. He removed all of the royal clothing and just wore a lime cloth. He then decided to only go by his surname, Gutma. And he spent the next six years or so traveling around northern India, going from teacher to teacher, from forest guru to ascetic looking for happiness, for truth. But it wasn't until well, one night while sitting under the Bodhi tree that he discovered the ultimate truth. And at that moment, he became awakened, awakened to the truth. And he became who we know as the Buddha. Interestingly enough, whenever Siddhartha's son was born, he called him Rahula, and this means chain or hindrance. When the Buddha had found enlightenment and he returned back to the kingdom, both his wife and Rahula became disciples of his. One day the Buddha was instructing his son using the image of a mirror. What do you think of this, Rahula? asked the Buddha. What is the purpose of a mirror? Rahula answered, its purpose is reflection. Even so, Rahula, a deed is to be done with the body after repeated reflection. A deed is to be done with speech and with the mind after repeated reflection. Take special note of the Buddha's deliberate double meaning with the mirror's reflection. To begin with, a mirror just simply reflects. It embodies clarity. It reveals what is before it. And for this reason, the mirror is a common metaphor in both Buddhist and Taoist teachings, particularly in Zen. These teachings urge us to be like a mirror, to have a clear mind, or a mirror mind, one that is uncluttered, that is free, it is empty. And just like the mirror, a mirror mind just reflects what becomes before it. It doesn't discriminate, it doesn't judge, and a mirror never clings to its own images. In the movie The Matrix, we see a significant use of this mirror reflection metaphor. In Agent Smith's sunglasses, Neo, or the One, is darkly reflected. He has two identities, Mr. Anderson and Neo. Which one shall he be? Morpheus's mirrored glasses reflect Neo much more clearly, especially when he's given the choice between the red pill and the blue pill. In one of the glasses, you see Neo with the blue pill. In the other glass, you see Neo with the red pill. Does he choose to wake up to the truth? Or does he choose to go to sleep and stay within the ignorance or the illusion. It is, it's interesting to note that these mirrored glasses are only worn within the matrix and never in the real world. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back.
You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Shortly after Neo swallows the red pill, he sits down in front of a broken mirror. As he's looking upon his reflection in the mirror, the mirror fixes itself. It becomes whole. Fascinated by this, Neo reaches out and he touches the mirror. It becomes almost like a liquid, and that wet mirror creeps its way up his arm and over his body. He becomes terrified. He is starting to discover the truth. He literally becomes the mirror. His metamorphosis into the mirror brings about his first real awakening. His awakening to the truth of what he thought was actually real was just an illusion. As Morpheus later puts it, it's a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control. Have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? This can't be. Be what? Be real? It's going into replication. Hey, boss. It's still nothing. It's gone. It's gone. Tank, we're going to need a signal soon. We got a fibrillation. Hey, Park, location. Targeting almost there. He's going into arrest. Lock, I got him. Now, Tank, now. Some of the most profound uses of the mirror reflection metaphors take place in and around the Oracle's apartment. The first time that Morpheus takes Neo to see the Oracle, Morpheus says, I'm trying to free your mind, Neo, but I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. At that point, Neo reaches for the highly polished doorknob. He can see his reflection within it, and without hesitation, he opens the door and enters the Oracle's apartment. I know what you're trying to do. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo, but I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. As Neo enters the Oracle's apartment, he sees a boy dressed as a Buddhist monk sitting in a full lotus position. The boy is telekinetically bending his spoon. He holds the spoon up to Neo so that Neo can see his reflection within the spoon. The boy then says to him, Do not try to bend the spoon. That is impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. There is no spoon. Then you will see that it is not the spoon that bends. It is only yourself. This gives Neo the first hint of his own powers whenever he then manages to bend the spoon that is offered to him. Throughout the movie, whenever Neo is in doubt of himself, he will say, there is no spoon, just as a reminder.
the oracle will see you now. As a side note, later on, whenever Neo is about to leave Zion to see the oracle once again, the character Kid catches up with him to give him a gift, saying, I have something to give to you, Neo, a gift from one of the orphans. He made me swear to give it to you before you left. He said that you would understand. Whenever Neo unwraps it, it turns out to be a spoon, showing that the spoon boy had also been freed from the Matrix, meaning that he had been freed from the illusions. The there is no spoon example is an excellent description of the Zen Buddhist parable about the three monks that are observing a flag waving in the wind. The first monk points out how the flag is moving. The second monk responds that it is not really the flag that is moving, but it is the wind that moves the flag. But the third monk says that neither the flag nor the wind is moving. It is only the mind that moves. Now, let's take it one step further. Because if there is no spoon, the mirror reflection reminds us that we need to be careful not to place too much importance on the images that are reflected within the mirror. The images are just images, nothing more and nothing less. So, in a sense, just as there is no spoon, there is also no mirror in the world that is being reflected in the mirror. They are just simply images. It is all an illusion. So in this light, the Buddha teaches us that the world that we know is just an illusion. If everything is just an illusion, does this mean that the world that we see and touch doesn't actually exist? This is where we start to get into the teachings of the Buddha, the foundations of emptiness. Many Buddhists, particularly from the Mahayana schools, claim that the illusionary nature of the world consists within the knowledge of the world. That is, the concrete world does exist so this is conventional thinking, but our views and our perceptions of reality do not match reality itself. The image in the mirror is not the reality that is in front of the mirror. Just as a photo of your friend is not actually your friend. Zen Buddhists claim a finger that points to the moon is not the moon. Our most insidious confusion is to mistake the images for reality. It is our mind that interprets and defines what is real for us. This illusion that the Buddhist teachings try to deliver us from, and in order to do so, we must free our minds. Most importantly, from a Buddhist perspective, we need to free our mind from the illusion of an independent, intrinsic, fixed self. Even though we stand before a mirror and we see ourselves, our image conveys nothing about what we really are. When you stand and you look at your image, you say, I or me. If my wife was to look at me, she would say, husband. When my children look at me, both of them would say father or dad, but my son's concept of me will be very different than my daughter's concept of me. My sister will look at me and she will say brother, but her concept of me is completely different than my children, my wife, or even myself. When I'm at work, my co-workers will say co-worker, but each one of the people that I work with will have a completely different entity that they see before them. Each one of them thinks that what they see is the true me, but it's not. So I ask you, who exactly am I? Am I 
Kevin? Am I husband? Am I father? Am I son? Am I brother? Am I some stranger on the street? Am I neighbor? Or am I all of them? Or none of them? This reaches right into the essence of the Buddha's teachings, namely emptiness, and more specifically, the emptiness of self. There is no self, just like there is no spoon. And if there is no spoon, there is no Neo. For Buddhists, there is no self. There is no independent, self-arising, separate entity. The idea of the no-self is called Atman, literally meaning no self. Therefore, we can use a mirror in the wrong way. We can use it to reinforce the illusion of the self and boost the ego, a self that is to us all-consuming, that in the absence of a mirror can be unnerving, even anguishing. In our inauthentic world, we need a mirror to reaffirm the illusion of the self and the separateness. Now, let us return to the Buddha's instruction to his son Rahula and consider the second meaning that he places on the mirror as symbolizing the mental act of reflection, examination, thinking things through. He instructs his son that careful reflection should precede action. More importantly, he cautions Rahula against acting without being aware of the impact of his actions upon other things, meaning karma. If you, Rahula, reflecting thusly, should find that deeds which I am desirous of doing with the body is a deed of my body that would conduce to the harm of myself or to the harm of others, and to the harm of both, then this deed of body is unskilled. Its yield is anguish and suffering. Its result is anguish. A deed of the body like this, Rahula, is certainly not to be done by you. This teaching to Rahula, again, talks about the Buddhist's most vital undercurrent, Emptiness, the idea of dependent origination. Dependent origination originally means that all things in existence are intricately interwoven within each other. So there is a natural interconnection among things. Therefore, nothing is independent nor separate. This being so, nothing is ever permanent since, according to uh, Buddhist doctrine, all things are changing. Nothing is independent and permanent, not even the self. To summarize, the Buddha reminds his son that in view of the interconnectedness of all things, the emptiness of all things, our actions have an impact upon others, meaning karma, and we need to reflect upon this before we act. I think at this point I'm going to end the talk. We have covered quite a lot and I don't want to bake your noodle too much. I will be making a part two of this as the matrix still has lots for us to reflect upon. I hope you've been taking a few notes as I encourage you to use this talk as a basis for an analytical meditation on emptiness, interdependence, and karma. So thank you for listening. I hope it wasn't too confusing. And if you liked the video, please give it the thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe.